plan for the rest of the time is I'm going to talk very, very briefly about uh, the, the second half of the problem. Once you've gone through this, all of this uh, classification of graphs and got down to a finite list of candidate principal graphs uh, for subfactors and index range you're looking at, you still have to actually construct and classify the subfactors for those principal graphs. And then we'll put up a big picture of uh, the currently known map of subfactors and um, talk a little bit about the, the phenomenology, uh, what we actually see and what we conjecture uh, going a little bit further about small index subfactors. Uh, but let me just, I'll just uh, spend a few minutes talking about constructions. Uh, so this is sort of the, um, the uh, unpleasant end of the business somehow uh, because I'm talking about uh, uh, constructing and classifying subfactors which you know nothing about and just have to use, uh, use brute force. So the problem, so given uh, gamma a principal graph, Classify all subtractors. Is there? Where's the trick? Okay. And uh, because you know nothing except the principal graph, none of this is pretty. Uh, although, as we've already seen in some of the talks, uh, many subfactors have been sort of constructed by extremely unpleasant methods, and then we've later understood uh, better constructions for them. Of course, that's very important. OK, so first of all, uh, it's a finite, uh, but, well, and, uh, and in principle, always manageable problem uh, to recover all the fusion rules. That is, the principal graph uh, just tells you about tensor product with one particular object in your, in your, uh, uh, in your two category. But you can recover everything about the, the multiple such as the tensor products pretty quickly. And so Ockniani rigidity at this point guarantees finiteness in this problem. Uh, and the challenge is just to actually make that effective. Uh, okay. And there are essentially uh, just sort of three reasonable approaches at this level of generality. And all of them work in a kind of similar way, uh, we'll produce uh, some equations, uh, a gauge group, uh, such that uh, there's a map from um, orbits of solutions two orbits of solutions from uh, the set of realizations of that principal graph by subfactors. And in these different approaches, we get different sorts of maps here. And sort of in the, the simplest, most straightforward thing, this is just an isomorphism. But in other cases, we, we just have a map. Uh, and you still need to understand the fibers of that map. But the point is that typically in these three approaches, uh, the fibers are easy to understand. So you, you reduce the problem just to uh, a problem of solving some equations uh, and identifying the orbits of solutions. So what are these three approaches? Well, one is just to write down the Pentagon equations for the six J symbols. And uh, I'm not going to say very much about this because it's, it's basically useless. I mean, uh, it's in some sense ideal. Uh, in this setup, uh, we have an isomorphism here. But in practice, you just can't do anything with it on interesting examples. Uh, the second thing is to look at uh, is to look for these things called biunitary connections, and so this is just looking at a subset of the six J symbols. So only look at six J symbols in a particular form. The six J symbols are just evaluations of, uh, uh, of a tetrahedron in your category with. Uh, edges labeled by simple objects and vertices labeled by the intertwiners, but we only look at 6 J symbols where a pair of opposite edges in this tetrahedron are labeled by X, our favorite object, the, uh, um, the object which the principal graph is recording the tensor product multiplicities for, 
and then there are four other labels here, A, B, C, D. Okay. So we just restricted that subset of the 6J symbols, uh, and these satisfy some quadratic equations. And uh, <clears throat> so certainly if you have a, a, um, a realization, uh, you get a solution, okay? So that gives you this map here. Uh, and I don't want to go into the details, but uh, typically, if you can describe the biunitary connections, uh, you can, in practice, generally work out which orbits of biunitary connections are not hit by this map, and you can identify the fiber if there's, if there's multiplicity coming from here down to here. Now, uh, this approach is, is in some ways great because there are far fewer variables in these equations, there are fewer, fewer uh, if you're looking at a subset of 6J symbols, uh, and the equations are better, they're only quadratic, uh, and you can, you can make some progress. And then the third approach uh, is using the, the graph planar algebra embedding. So here, the idea is you look at the uh, the planar algebra associated to your supposed subfactor, and uh, there's a lovely theorem that says that that planar algebra always embeds in uh, this thing called the graph planar algebra of the principal graph that we started with, uh, and this is just this is a purely combinatorial thing. It only depends on the uh, on the graph and the list of the uh, of the dimensions of all the, the simple objects. And it's some planar algebra. You can state this in category theory language as well, but it's somehow easiest in planar algebra language. Okay. Um, so the thing you do with this embedding is that uh, just looking at gamma in many cases uh, you can identify an element, I guess we often call it S, uh, that would have to exist in the planar algebra of your putative subfactor, uh, satisfying certain polynomial equations. Where, uh, by polynomial, I mean something a little bit funny, I mean that I'm allowing the multiplications here are sort of planar operations uh, in this planar algebra. And so, uh, and so we can look for solutions to, to that system of equations in this purely uh, combinatorial approach. Yeah. In particular, if there are no solutions, there are no planar algebras written with that. And again, uh, because any realization using this embedding, uh, we obtain a map from, from realizations to, uh, to, uh, to uh, solutions of these equations in the graph planar algebra. And typically, uh, I mean, this depends on exactly sort of which element and which equations you, you pick, but typically, again, the fiber of this map is, is pretty easy to understand. Uh, this approach tends to be uh, quite nice in that, uh, again, the equations are often just quadratic. Maybe I should have said pentagon equations are, are cubic. So the equations are a lower order. Often there are very few variables, less than either of the other two approaches. And the best thing of all is that in the examples one cares about, typically one finds that these polynomial equations uh, have actually discretely many solutions, or, or a very small, uh, a very small dimension uh, of a very small dimensional space of solutions. Uh, so often, often that's extremely practical. But an important thing to say also is that uh, unlike in this case, where uh, where, where there's complex conjugation involved, uh, this really is a polynomial problem. So you can, you can use uh, sort of applied algebraic geometry and, to, and you can use Grebner bases in particular to attack things here. Um, so maybe the, the two things to say is that in both of these cases, uh, you end up you know, doing some work by hand uh, and then handing things over to Grebner bases or computer solvers at some point. Uh, 
some people in the audience are spectacular at using this method entirely by hand, uh, not me. Um, and uh, maybe the thing that the two th things to say about these two methods is that they're ex they're actually extremely closely related, although I haven't said how a flat a flat by unitary connection gives you an embedding and, and, and there are close relations. And that although uh, so far methods two and three have only really been described and used in the subfactor case, they work perfectly generally. And uh, if you want to do the same problem for fusion categories, multi-fusion categories, and so on. All this technique works exactly, although no one's actually done that in practice. Uh, on anything yet. Uh, I think at this point, it's probably best to actually stick up our big picture. And maybe I'll just briefly point at a few and say which methods get used in which places. So this, uh, so just reiterating things, Noah said, here's 3 plus square root 1. Uh, that's sort of the classical story of the ADE series. Uh, just, uh, uh, where is it? Uh, 3 plus square root 2. Where does 3 plus square root 2 fall in all of this? I can never remember. Between extended high rep and state Somewhere in there. Okay. And then 3 plus square root 3 is there, and 3 plus square root 4 is all the way up there. Uh, so I, don't, I guess Noah didn't actually say the result from, the, from 3 plus square root 4, but there, there are just five subfactors in there, each of, each of which come in, in two closely related varieties, either duals or complex conjugates. Uh, and uh, some of them we've heard about before, uh, or many of them we've heard about before, I guess. Uh, that, I mean, this is just a hug group, which we've heard about plenty. This is a, uh, a 2 to the n1. Subfactors, so that's a, a near group one that, uh, that we discussed on the first day. This guy's is a senior hard group up here, which, as Pinas explained, is actually closely related uh, to, um, to these three to the n subfactors. And then this extended hard group, which is kind of the, the odd man out at the moment, which we know very little about. Um, and the GHJ. Ah, uh, and the GHJ, yeah, which is somehow uh, not that exciting. It's sort of related to things below the X4. By a, by a simple so maybe just to briefly talking about each of the bands higher up where we don't yet have uh, that many theorems. Well, at index five, we know exactly what goes on, although the details haven't actually been published anywhere. Um, and there are just five subfactors there, and they're all group subgroup subfactors. So it's very it's very simple at index five. Now above index five. The only theorems we have are in the one super transitive case uh, where uh, initially uh, Emily and I got up to 3 plus square root 5 uh, and just discovered that there's just one thing there and it's a quantum group subfactor. Um, let's look at SU2 at level 7, I think. No, it must be something smaller than that. I forget what number it is. SU2 at level 5. Uh, and look at the three-dimensional objects. So there's just something coming from quantum groups, and, uh, and otherwise there's nothing there. And then uh, Cheng Wei and the data Isn't there another quantum group subfactor that is the thing? The, but it's two super transitive. Yeah. So there's SU3 at level 4. Oh, okay. sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. So maybe yeah. you probably can't see the color shading here, but there's meant to be um, a blue bit here for, uh, for sort of the classical history. Uh, there's a green region here because everything up to 5 and then this band up to one super transitive all the way along here. And then there's the red region where we have ideas about what's going on, but no theorems at this point. Uh, and so, yeah, the other quantum group one is at that same index, but out in the red region, you don't have any theorems. Uh, 
And so then uh, Dave and Jing Wei and I have done the, the one super transitive case all the way out to six and a, six and a fifth, well, six and a fifth, excluding six. And the basic idea of one super transitive is, as Dave was saying, uh, very often you can realize they must be an intermediate, but if there's an intermediate, then your index value must be a product of other possible index values, and they just aren't in this region any values that can be products except 3 plus square root 5 and at 6. Let me interrupt and say, at 3 plus root 5, uh, Zhang Wei solved the problem of, of yeah. the possible which standard variants exist for composites of A3 yeah. and A4. Yeah. So now at, at index 3 plus square root 5, uh, at arbitrary supertransitivity, uh, so first of all, there's an infinite depth subfactor. Uh, so the first infinite depth subfactor besides just uh, the template leave subfactor, uh, which appears here, and it's a free product. It's just the free product of the A3 and A4 subfactors. And then everything else at index 3 plus square root 5 uh, is in some sense related to that. Uh, so there's a, there's a series of, uh, well, a finite series of quotients of that free product um, where Zheng Wei gave the, the classification. So there's, so there's sort of the tensor product of A3 with A4, but then there's two more things which are also quotients of the free product. So it's, and I think initially we'd all thought that there was going to be an infinite series starting from the tensor product and going all the way up to the free product. And it was somewhat of a surprise that there's only a, a finite series. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other things that we know at 3 plus square root 5. Uh, there's a, there are the, these two different uh, 3 to the 4 subfactors, which people have talked about before, and then uh, some subfactors closely related to these guys via equivariantizations and via equivariantizations and so on. Uh, and so I think at this point we know the, the story at the yes. Exactly. Is that a theorem or is that? Um, yeah, no, not quite. We, we know everything that's in mean, the, the point is that the, there's this intuition that uh, the larger the super transitivity, the harder it is for things to exist. So if you looked at things with small super transitivity and didn't find anything, then you maybe hope you found them all. So but like actually push. ruling out the <coughs> super transitive ones is, is hard. They, do, they don't ex exist, it seems, so, ever, but uh, you can't prove it. I mean, so maybe uh, the thing to say there is that, and this is still very much just working in progress, but for this whole band between 5 and 3 plus square root 5, uh, we can say a bunch of, of things about what couldn't possibly exist. And one sort of easy statement to say is that if there's anything in there that doesn't appear on this chart, then it has rank at least 40. There, that is, there are at least 40 vertices in the principal graph. And you can probably push that a little bit further for a little bit more work. Uh, but we very strongly suspect that there's actually nothing, and that at least up to this line here, that this map is now accurate, and there's, there's not going to be anything more. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, Maybe the thing to emphasize is that up to this line, there's really not a lot. Uh, the, there's, there's quantum group stuff, there's these 3 to the n subfactors, and close relatives of 3 to the n subfactors, uh, and then quotients of this, of this free product. And that's the entire story. Right, right. 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 what thing you just said was for, which, for the whole band between 5 this whole This whole band up to including 3 plus square root 5. I should also, I want to and I mean, there are stronger results than that rank lower band. Like, I could tell you certain families that are all that could possibly exist. And, Reasons to expect nothing from that system. Small qualification at 3 plus root 5 that um, we're talking about standard invariants, right? We don't know about the uh, okay. number okay. of subfactors with the free product standard invariant at sure. 3 plus root 5. Sure. Yeah, so there's this, there's this problem that the, the, the plane of algebra the standard invariant stops being a uh, complete invariant. Okay. And now, uh, between going beyond the 3 plus square root 5, uh, I couldn't make any bets about. I mean, I couldn't, I, there are no, no solid theorems, like there are no examples of rank below blah. Uh, and so we've listed a bunch of things that, that we do know exist uh, up above here. There's this guy, high group plus one, which is sort of related to the, uh, the mover equivalence class of the high group subfactor. There's another, uh, there's another 3 to the n, uh, sorry, 2 to the 2 to the n, one subfactor that appears here. There's a quantum group subfactor that appears here, along with some strange non graded relatives of that quantum group subfactor. Uh, and, uh, and and this guy often called Hagrup with legs, uh, which um, is in some ways related to quantum group stuff, but, but it's a little complicated. And uh, I, 
I wouldn't give you that good odds that there's nothing more, but we've looked pretty hard in that range. It's possible. Uh, What's that? Uh, that well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm glad I didn't offer anyone the bet that there's nothing missing on that thing because. <laughs> well, that's 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 good enough. Yeah. Okay. So that's possibly a reasonable approximation of reality, but there's very few theorems in in this range. This is just computer surfing. Uh, and then at one super transitive guys, I think this is exactly six. Things get really bad, and we uh, not only is there the possibility that subpatches aren't classified by their standard invariance, it's definite, and, and uh, the, the, the problem really breaks down at that point. Uh, yeah. Even if you only care about finite depth ones, there are infinitely many, there's one for every quotient of SL2Z, so. So maybe the, the final thing to say is about super transitivity. Yeah, yeah, so I, I mentioned this before, but uh, um, our feeling is that there aren't highly super transitive things out there. Um, and there's analogies of this, like for, for quantum subgroups of SUN, which we'll hear more about later, there are theorems like that that say <laughs> you can't have high super transitivity. And similarly, the analogous fact about transitive group actions you can't have highly transitive group actions unless they're boring. Um, one might hope that there's a similar theorem here, but we don't know. And so it's sort of annoying that often one can prove results that do a classification for small supertransitivity, and one expects there's nothing for high supertransitivity, but there's just no way to prove it. And so if you ever see anything that might give some sort of bound on supertransitivity, that would be phenomenal. Um, so on, on the super transitivity thing, this thing that I mentioned about quotients of the free product of A3 and A4, uh, there was this initial expectation that maybe there was this infinite family of, of quotients, uh, which sort of would have been like a uh, sort of a D series with, with arbitrarily high super transitivity. It's not super transitivity now, it's some other notion of super transitivity for things living inside free products. Uh, but then the discovery that there's actually only finitely many in that series is sort of another piece of evidence that it's hard to be highly Super transitive, highly super transitive, or related functions. And I mean, the number theory results uh, are a result in that direction, but that's for a fixed end of your graph. Yeah. One, one thing to say so uh, there's this result that if you fix the end of the graph and just have an arbitrary tail, uh, then there's at most finitely many uh, graphs which can be graphs of sub factors. Frank Caligari's student whose name, unfortunately, we still don't know, so I can't tell you their name, um, has apparently uh, proved a result that says, if you look at the set of, of so fix, uh, fix an n, a greatest possible valence in the graph, and fix a k, uh, the greatest possible number of vertices, which are more than two valent, but still below the highest valence, then he says there's only finitely many possible principal graphs in that entire gigantic set. Uh, and so, in some sense, that's kind of a big generalization of the, the super transitive. You can't add lots of two valent vertices. To it. somehow that um, if you start with a fusion category and produce a, a subfactor, you're really only ever looking at alternating products of x with x dual. And so somehow that the, 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 point of, the tensor product of the pointed category disappears at the end. Mm -hmm. so we're only looking at, at things generated by a morphism that goes from one object to a different object. So you almost assume it's self-dual. Another way of well, saying that is you're only looking at algebra objects. To get from an arbitrary object to an algebra, you can look at x tensor x dual. Mm -hmm. But if you take x and modify it by looking at x tensor g, that doesn't, you get the same algebra for x tensor x dual. Okay. <clears throat> I know so much about modular tensor categories. I'm surprised that um, 
you guys have never really used the double, look at the double and try to squeeze out more information, balance or whatever. It doesn't really seem to And the trouble is somehow, once you have a specific fusion ring or principal graph in mind, then you can use the double, but you can do so many other things then. Somehow the difficulty is always when you only know sort of the first part of the fusion rules, but it's still arbitrary other stuff, and it feels like the double is completely inaccessible. The, the number theory is extraordinarily powerful and used all over the place here, and the number theory goes through the center. So the center does come up, but only in that, only in that way. Yeah, if you wanted to classify braided ones, uh, you would use different techniques. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, if you look at the, what is it, Longo and Rare, you can have classification results for braided things that go much past what we can do. Uh, so once you put in braiding, you can start using sky theoretic techniques to get better theorems, and this is not the approach to take. Breeding's on the even part. And I mean, that's about a breeding.